Welcome to today's episode of our Dollars and Cents podcast. If you are listening to the Dollars and Cents podcast for the first time, it's a show where we discuss some of the most interesting finance topics with various guests. And for today's episode, we are filming at a different location than usual. We are here at the Suntec Convention Center for Moonfest 2024. And I have with me one of the speakers for the Moonfest 2024, none other than a very popular Don Chen, the lady behind Singapore's most popular finance blog, SG Budget Bait. Don, welcome to the show. Hi. Right, and you know, our topic today for Dawn is the evolution of financial content and how budget bait has evolved after a decade. So Dawn, it has been 10 years since you started SG Budget Bait. You know, I, I remember because I was there. Yeah, I met we you. were at the beginning. Yeah, we were at the beginning. Uh, so some people say we are the OGs of uh, finance blogs, finance <laughs> publisher. Uh, we are older for sure. And we'll, we'll come to that later on, all right? Um, but I just want to bring us back 10 years ago, right? So when you first started SG Budget B, there's a few interesting statistics. Tesla share price was about $14 back then. You know, Apple shares were about $20, $20 Apple shares back then, 10 years ago. It was already a popular company, by the way. It's about 10 times more expensive today. And a couple of things, TikTok hasn't started. So TikTok started in 2016. So obviously you're not a TikToker, back then at least. Uh, and I think back then there was also no finance YouTubers as well, yeah. right? So people like us were writing, uh, we're not filming. So I just want to ask you, what got you started on SG Budget Pay? Like what was so inspiring? I like writing. Um, my childhood ambition was to be an author. And since I couldn't be an author at such a young age because no one was taking a gamble on me, then my then boyfriend, now husband said, then you self-publish, right? And blogs were just so easy. So I write, no? And I just wrote what I felt like writing, uh, what I thought was useful to me and my friends at that time. So a lot of my topics, I didn't even set out wanting to be a financial blogger. It just so happened that at that time, my biggest achievement was having saved 20000 in a year. And all my friends were asking me out for lunch to, to know how I did it. I obviously didn't have time to meet every single friend to catch up. So after a while, I was like, I'm just going to write a blog article. Since my husband says, like, just write whatever you've been talking. Right then, I said to my friend, hey, I can't meet you, but here's the, here's the gist, okay? You have questions, then you ask me. And then after that, went unexpectedly viral. Uh, and you saw the, the I, I remember the that, article. Right, yeah. And it was very like, polarizing. Some people, yes. I mean, that it was very popular, right? Because 20,000 in a year. And I think back then you just graduated. Uh, you just uh, started working, right? I think, right? yeah, one or two years ago. Right. right. So I, I remember a lot of people were saying, if I recall correctly, because it's been 10 years, like yeah. some people were asking, hey, you know, how much she made? You yeah. Know, must and be I, she make a lot of money, of yeah. course, can say. Yes, and uh, it was polarizing also because we were in that era where people were not transparent with their finances. Oh, that's right? true. Right? People don't talk about their pay, people don't talk about their savings. They want like, ah, it's sensitive. I yeah, yeah, exactly. And my parents wouldn't very big on it, me sharing that as well. But I think also, I got so much hate for it. <laughs> yeah, what, explain, explain that. Were they just jealous or they don't believe you could do it? I don't know. Like, um, well, there were comments such as people saying, oh, she must be never give her parents allowance. Uh, yeah, yeah. Don't sell right? That's why she can save so much money. And then others are like, must be uh, eating off her boyfriend all the time. The yeah. boyfriend pays for all the dates. That's why she can save so much money. I'm like, dude, I go Dutch. I give my parents allowance. I do, actually do the things that you guys are accusing me not of not doing, I do them and I still manage to save $20,000. Yeah, no, I think I do agree with you. Like back then, talking about money was somewhat sensitive. And firstly, you don't have much finance blogs. Mm. Like, I mean, there were some bloggers, uh, some of them are here today, but both, Very they were like stock bloggers and they tend yeah. to write about stocks they invest in Correct. rather than to share their own personal finance experience. Yeah. Right? Mm. Uh, Back then, you don't have people flashing their one M six five kind of like. <laughs> nowadays, you see right like Sydney every Everyone sort of the year. Like how much they have. The interest they they make. Yeah, right? in our era, we got these kind yeah, of things. Yeah. Don't have. It was very sensitive back then. So you started budget B, uh, but then back then you were a lot younger, obviously. Um, and since then, you have gone through many life stages, right? Which some people will call adulting, right? So you got married. I was there. I mean, I wasn't the. He was at the wedding. I was at the wedding as a guest, right? Okay, so you got married, you have kids, two kids today. Uh, you changed your jobs a couple of times. As well, you bought a house. Being in the space, I know like a lot of us, when we start writing when we were young, um, it gets harder to continue writing or producing content as we grow older, right? So I just want to ask you from your own personal experience, how, how difficult was it for you to continue keeping up with, with the site after all these years, especially because you're so much more busy today? 
difficult, yeah. very difficult. But I think what helps is that uh, when you, en- you truly enjoy what you do. So for me, I truly enjoy writing. I really love writing. It, like, it's like my escape right, from real life. And I also love teaching. And I used to be a tuition teacher when you still knew, knew me. Now I no longer teach one-on-one. I teach through my platforms. So I think because of this combination, I write and I teach. It helps me to continue because I actually enjoy what I do. So it doesn't really feel so much like work. But of course, I always wish like I had two of me or uh, 24 times two hours a day, you know, so I could do more. But it's really just like trying to figure out how do we balance while still not missing out on my kids' childhood and everything else that we need. Yeah, yeah, because I'm, I mean, the whole adulting phase is, is certainly one where, you know, you just become a lot more staff or time, especially if you've got multiple commitments at the same yeah. time. I also want to ask, like, because for me, I feel that as well. Like, as you grow older, do you feel like your personal perspective on finance also change? Because, you know, you grow older, you have kids, you buy a house. Yes. Topics just become a lot more relatable. Yes, and I think also with age, uh, we mature and learn from more different perspectives. I'll use ILPs as an example. Investment and, link policies. Yes, yeah, investment link policies. I was strongly against it, like 100% no. It was really only over the years as I start to talk to more people, I listen and open up. We open to a three different perspective. I started understanding that there is a place for every financial product and solution. And these people, they happily pay the higher fees even though they know what trade-offs it comes with because they just can't do it themselves. It's so easy for everyone online to say, stop your ILP, don't buy life insurance, buy term and invest the rest. The thing is, people then switch out of life and buy them, they don't invest the rest. Or they buy them and don't, they don't keep up their premium, they lose their coverage. All this stuff happens because we assume that every individual is disciplined, self-driven and has time and, mo- and effort to monitor all these things. But as I grew older, I realised that actually you do get busy with a lot of other things on your plate. And there are different solutions to different trade-offs, you just choose what works best for you. Yeah, so I, I'm more like balanced now, I feel. I, I think two things also to note, right? Like, Firstly, all products that we typically talk about, we talk about are MES regulated. Yes. So they are not bad products per se, Correct. but I think the problem sometimes is that when someone invests or buy a product that they don't fully understand, that may yes. not be suitable for them. Exactly. That's where the problems arise. Yes, but online is always such an extreme, right? It's like, yeah. oh, you promote, you, you are okay for life insurance, you must be an insurance agent, you must be sponsored, and all these things. Oh, you talk about an IRP, you must be sponsored to pay that money. No, it's not. It's like, I may talk about it, I may not be sponsored, or even if I am, it doesn't matter if I talk about it. It doesn't mean it's a bad or good product to say. Everything that I do is always pros and cons. I actually, that's my biggest problem with the sponsored things that I take on today because I, I'm insisting on the pros and cons every single time. A lot of clients, you know, like, right? Yeah. They're in the same thing. They're it's, always it's like, hard. I only want the pros. Don't talk about the cons. I'm like, no, that does not work for my brand, does not work for my audience. If you don't want the cons, we're out of this deal. I think the problem with marketing sometimes from the product player product marketers' point of view is that they always want to highlight the, the USP, yes. the value proposition, exactly. you know, but um, as we know after a while, you know, there's always pros and cons, exactly. right? Exactly, yes. And and if, uh, if you only focus on the positive, it really misleads a lot of people and they feel even more cheated later on when they learn of the negative through other channels, right? It's better if upfront we tell them, like, what, dollars and then you guys do also, you're very transparent, all, everything all weighted in, so we, are, we can click that way, right? And your audience make their own decision, balancing those trade-offs. I think, I think one, one thing we presume always is that the audience is educated mm. in a way, right? So gone are the days where people cannot find information from other sources. So if you have a product, a platform, and you say just only all the good things, you may not be wrong, you may be correct, but then, you know, it's very easy for the audience, especially if they know it's a sponsored post, yeah. to just Google and then yes. you could be accused of, hey, you are only saying the good things. You're not saying all these other things that also, you know, is worth knowing. Yeah, and I, sometimes I do free content, I think of people ask, is this sponsored? I'm like, hey, it's free. If it's sponsored, it will be declared yeah, as sponsored. Yeah, I always declare, we always declare, right? We started declaring it before it was even a regulation. Yeah. I remember that because back in those days, there were no regulations on online content. Now there is, and we had to start that practice of we're going to disclose upfront because we believe it's important to let our audiences know. Yeah, and I think that's how you um, establish your, your reputation to your, to your readers as well. I think the other thing I would want to note is that today there's a lot more content creators exploring finance topics, right? Yeah, uh, most, more popular than us. <laughs> most of them don't write. I, I, that's what I remember. Most of them, the new people don't write so much. 
uh, where's Kelvin Learn Investing? He's there. <laughs> he doesn't write so much. He's very popular. He's a YouTuber. <laughs> uh, Kelvin, you don't write much, right? Yeah, he's not video. He's a YouTuber, videos, right? So most people, they don't write much. They are YouTubers, they are TikTokers or Instagrammers, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but, you know, there's a lot more influencers or KOLs in the finance space. Do you feel like how finance became a topic? Why did it become such a popular topic? I think it really goes back to the TikTok wave during the COVID lockdowns because um, number one, people are stuck at home, they now have more time on their hands. And number two, like in the US especially, they were giving out all this money. You can't travel, you can't spend, so you put it in the stock market, right? And that popularity just trickled over to the rest of the world, like to Singapore. So I think that was really what got it started because it was so interesting for us to see that shift. And actually on hindsight, I really regret not having been on TikTok at that time. Right. Right, like my TikTok is, our TikTok is non-existent because we did not it's, it's there, it's that. there. You can follow us on TikTok, can follow but, us on TikTok, but it's we not so popular. Wave, right? So it was a bit wasted. Uh, and I mean, I always think media trends come and go, right? So when we started, it was the blogging phase. During the COVID era, it was the YouTubers, the TikTokers that became popular. I can even see a guy being filmed right now as we are talking. Yeah. <laughs> it's like me as a TikToker. No, it's actually the, the video folks are very popular because yeah. the faces are always seen. But I always think it also goes down to the way one learns. And honestly, we are we are writers because we learn through text a lot, right? Yeah. And I think for finance products, really, you need the text. Videos, I don't feel is the best way, but videos I feel are great for awareness. But you really want to dive into the details, it's always text. You know, these days, it's not just finance YouTubers or TikTokers talking about financial products, right? Mm. You see a lot of lifestyle influencers, popular people, more popular than me, obviously, uh, talking about money-related stuff, even though they don't typically write or talk about finance products. And usually, the reason is because there's advertising dollars. Yes. You know, with all these advertising dollars coming into the finance marketing space, it's a lot of um, people saying also, hey, you know, these guys are just doing it for the money. Mm. Um, and obviously, sometimes they will lump yourself into that category to some extent, saying that, hey, you know, Budget Bank is only writing for it because of advertising dollars. Yeah just like all the other lifestyle influencers. Um, never mind the fact that when you started, there was no advertising dollars. Um, do you think that this is something, or, or how, what do you feel about it? Like, I think number one, time is the biggest uh, truth revealer. We have built our reputation over 10 years. Our readers will have followed up. All of our track record is there. And we don't, we're not like people who take down things, right? Everything yeah. is there. So you can actually search what we said last time. And you can see that our values have not changed. We have outrightly spoken out against bad products. We don't just say things because we're paid to. So the reputation, I think, at the end of the day, is important. But it's hard for new audiences because if they don't know who we are, they're just learning from us for the first time, they lump us into that shape. Lah. So I don't blame them. But as they follow, I think over time, you'll be able to distinguish who are the fake gurus from the real deals, right? Yeah. And I think the other thing also, and this is the more concerning part, which is we have a lot more non-finance people jumping onto the bandwagon. I noticed that the quality and the accuracy of the financial advice is really going downhill. Yeah, I, I wouldn't even call it advice. I feel like sometimes the content, it could be my wife actually showed me a skit from one of the one of Singapore's most popular YouTuber. I'm not mm. gonna say who because anyway, you guys can guess. <laughs> Um, and I mean, it's a finance brand, right? And the whole idea about, oh, you must invest for your future. But sometimes I feel like it's, I mean, the message is not wrong. You need to invest for the future. But, you know, there's no content in terms of any of the, yeah, you know, what you invest in. Yeah, the nuances are not being yeah, captured. It's a very simple message. You exactly. need to invest. And I, I see also, like, not just that, that's actually quite okay. But I've seen very worrying trends such as, a lot of lifestyle people, if you remember a few years ago when buy now pay later was very, very big, all the freaking lifestyle people were being paid to promote it. Yeah, that was and ridiculous. And I was like, number one, yeah. you can jolly well afford to pay off on your own. Why do you need to split it up into three installments? Number two, you're luring all these people in with the discount yeah. and you're not teaching them to pay off on time. That was the biggest problem. They were not being transparent about the, the interest rates uh, and the, the cost of if you The BNPL thing. Yeah, yeah, so when I finally got like much, much later on, then I got a, only one uh, out of the main things, only one approach me for BNPL sponsorship. I was very upfront with them. I said, this is the problem I see in the market right now because of all the advertising dollars. I want to write this in this angle. Do, are you on board with me? If you're not, we're not, we not going to work together. Thankfully, they were. So I was able to put out a message that was very balanced. I talked about the, the, this is the benefits of it, but this is the real cost. And you need to make sure you avoid these costs. But how many of the rest did it? That, I mean, we, we, we had a podcast and an article on BNPR as well. I, I will put it on the notes. You guys can go 
read or listen to it. And uh, I listened to it recently as well, and I and I totally agree with you, right? Like BNPR is an example. And I just want to ask you, like, how do you actually balance between all these things? Because, um, I mean, I, I know that it's very challenging to create content. I actually say it sometimes, and I'm just going to say it all out. I think sometimes content creators, they have to do more than just a regular journalist. Yes. Right, yeah, like, you, you fully agree, right? We, I mean, I, luckily I was trained as an investigative journalist, yeah. so I really can apply those principles. Right, but, yeah, but, we do so much but for a content creator, you have to script it, you have to write it, you have to edit it if it's a video, you have to publish it. Um, and I'm not saying that a journalist doesn't, but like, it just feels like there's a lot more than just more the content catch, you right? produce. Yeah, exactly. um, how, how do you balance your day? Like, what is it like for you as a, a regular day or a regular week? So I think one thing is I learned to say no to many things. Okay. Yeah. Or maybe until maybe too much because I heard if from my friends working in advertising and media that I kind of have a reputation for saying no so often. That <laughs> sometimes some media and brands are now hesitant to work with me. Yeah. But I mean I I rather that than the other way around, right? Because I'm not going to say yes just because you throw money at me. I would say no even if you offered me a million dollars. If it's not on brand or it's not genuinely good for myself, my readers or my loved ones, then how that's the principle I work with. Uh, and learning how to say no, I feel, has helped with that balancing. And you have a full-time job yeah, also, know, just I FYI, know, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah, but because we learn to say no and we push aside what matters, right? I think that helps. The other thing I learned over the years also is that, honestly, you can make money, right? You, as long as you put in effort, you are willing to go down and get your hands dirty, you can make money anytime. It is better to walk away and not have to burn out from making, like, honestly, you make this much money versus this much money, but the trade off in terms of your mental and time and your family is huge, right? And these are things that, that difference in money is not life changing, it doesn't justify it. So I'd rather earn less, but get back my, you know, draw by lines. Yeah, you know something, like, I was just talking to my daughters earlier today. They were asking me where I was going to go. And I'm saying, oh, I, I'm trying to explain to them in a way they can understand. So I say, oh, I'm going to go for an event because I'm going to film some YouTube videos because mm. this will be going out on YouTube. And the second I say YouTube videos that I'm going to do some YouTube videos, they get super excited, <laughs> right? When they see me writing articles, nobody gets excited. Ah, yeah. but, but when they know I'm making YouTube videos, they get super excited. My son as well, he just saw me on an ad on YouTube. You're like, Mommy, I saw you on an ad. I'm like, really, which ad? I don't even know which one. Do you, okay, I'm just going to ask, what's your advice for younger people? Maybe not as young as our kids, but like someone who's in their teens now. They see what you're doing. They think it's interesting because maybe finance is also an interesting topic with them. They want to be a YouTuber. What's one or two advice you would give them? I would say when you're young, go and try all the things that you want to try so you have no regrets. Right. But don't expect too much from it because I, I really believe if someone goes in with the expectation of I'm going to be a full-blown YouTuber and you don't achieve it, yeah, you'll be crushed. Lah. For and sure. Honestly, I think both of us, we never expected this to become what it was today, right? It just happened because yeah. we stuck at it. We enjoyed what we were doing. We applied our values and we were good at it. And we let things fall into play. So I feel that the scene is getting more and more competitive. If last time you were a YouTuber, you just needed to be hardworking to put out a video, you would get the traction. But that doesn't always apply anymore because the competition is really sitting up. Yeah, what's next for SG Budget Bay? I'm writing a book. So you're writing a book? Yes, I got a book deal. I got offered nice. and approved by a publisher, so I'm really excited. I was supposed to start writing last month, but I got caught up with work. So I hopefully uh, will start writing this month and the book will launch next year. Uh, my work has also very thankfully gotten a lot of, uh, caught a lot of prominent figures uh, attention recently. So, SG budget bit. Yeah, and right. I'm very thankful because it's like putting Singapore on the map, right? So I was recently featured by Gov.SG, if you saw that. And then I was also uh, picked up by Nas Daily. I was also picked up by another finance brand overseas and I'm their only Asia creator that they work with. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so I think it's really exciting now. It's on the cups of change and I hope that with this uh, bigger influence and awareness, we can push the standards in the way that we feel should it should be at rather than you know KOL just getting money and just doing what the advertisers tell them because it should never be about that right but I, I, I can't wait for the book to come out I think we should do another podcast I'll give once you a out. copy for sure for sure <laughs> right and um, but thank you so much for joining us today uh, for this podcast also this podcast recording uh, we are at the Moon Fest 2024 so um, if you are Hearing a little bit of noise in the background uh, is because we are filming outdoor. And I need to hop off soon for my panel, so thank you for having right, me. Right. Please follow both of us 
on Instagram, our blog, on TikTok was yeah. our set smaller TikTok. But yes, follow all yeah. of us. If, if you're watching us on YouTube, you can follow us on YouTube. If you're listening us on Spotify, follow us on Spotify. If you're seeing it on Instagram, follow us on IG. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Don is going for another uh, another discussion. So all the best there. And thank you. I'll catch you. See you around. Yeah.